Yeah. Okay, uh, welcome to part two of our top five movies of all time. Um, we did number five to three, I think it was last time. Yeah, it was five to three. Well, I did ten to three because I'm a prick and I didn't actually go over the top five. And um, hopefully you enjoyed the last one and you'll enjoy this one. So, uh, what's your number three? My number three is pretty much the only film on my list that I am... Not that I'm embarrassed about, but that I, I feel I probably won't get much support for it. Well, great. So I, I'd go out on a limb. How do you feel about Will Smith? I uh, love him. A little bit crazy with the old Scientology thing. But uh, his his movies tend to be excellent. Very entertaining. No, I'm actually kind of surprised by that. I, I'm a fan of film. I like kind of studying film and things like that. But I say studying film. I mean, like I like reading up about you know, behind <laughs> the scenes stuff. I read books on movies, things like that. Well, like, there's nothing more fun than watching going into the cinema and watching just an entertaining movie. That's why Twenty One Jump Street is in my top yeah. ten. Like, it's it's a movie that there's no, it's not an Oscar worthy movie. Do you know what I mean? It's not going to win any awards, but it's fucking hilarious, and I love yeah. it. Fast Five as well is the most ridiculous film I've ever seen in my life. They drag a safe down the road in Rio, but it's brilliant, and I've seen it about six times. Yeah, um, no, the only reason I bring it up is because it's not because I'm a huge fan of Will Smith. Um, but he actually he does tend to turn up a lot in the films I like. As I said earlier, I went with categories because I found it hard to come up with a top five list. The category I had in, the, in tour place was uh, sci-fi, and I went with I, Robot. Now, not a popular choice. I know a lot of people weren't that keen on it. Um, but the reason I like it probably takes a little bit of explaining. I've read pretty much all of the Isaac Asimov book, books ever since I was a kid. So I had a very kind of, I don't know, a very kind of solid view of what kind of world what, what kind of universe they take place in. So when I found out there was going to be a film coming out, I kind of had a feeling that they'd ruin it, that they'd completely, it would be a misfire. They'd get everything yeah. wrong. And then when I found out Will Smith was in it and the big budget and all that, I was like, there's no way they're going to capture the atmosphere of the books. And to a certain extent, they really didn't. Uh, the books, they tend to be very, uh, very wordy, very kind of heavy. It's all about, uh, I don't know, have you ever read any, any of the books? No, I haven't. No. Boy no. Robot wasn't one particular novel, it was a collection of, of stories about androids and what have you. Um, no, but it's, they're really more like, you know the way Lord of the Rings was supposedly written uh, as a sort of exercise in uh, coming up with new cultures and languages and stuff like this by J.R.R. Tolkien? Yeah. The, the story of Lord of the Rings was really just the vehicle for him, supposedly, that's how the theory goes. Uh, well, the Oi Robot stories were pretty much the same thing. Uh, it, it wasn't so much about the story, it was about the whole thing about the tree laws and how yeah. humans interact with it and, and how they accept them in culture and what have you. So when I heard the film was coming out, I was like, right, they're completely going to not do that. It's just going to be about killer robots and it's not going to be about the highbrow stuff. Yeah. Um, but they, they, they kind of nailed it. They kind of got it right. It was about that. It was about how they're accepted in society and this, that and the other. Now, that's beneath the surface. On the surface, it is pretty much just an action film. Um, yeah, and that's why I can see why a lot of cinema goers would be a little bit disappointed in it because as an action film, it's not really up there with the best action films out there. Because you have better choices if you're doing a top five action films. But yeah. for me, from my point of view, also another thing I love about the film is I think they do, they did a really really good job of creating a believable universe that feels. I think it's a, is it Chicago. Yeah, I, Chicago twenty thirty six or something like this. It feels. Like they, they, they thought of everything. Everything feels exactly the way it should feel. Nothing. It, I mean, there's a lot of futuristic stuff. You've got robots walking around. You've got cars with spheres instead of wheels, stuff like yeah. that. But it still feels like it's just, you know, the not too distant future. It's not unbelievable yeah. the stuff that happens in it. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's been a universe created like that since probably Blade Runner was probably the last film, but previous to Aero, that felt like a fully realized universe. Yeah, that was actually the first film that came into my head when you mentioned that was Blade Runner is a real kind of... Uh, yeah. Actually, Star Wars as well, maybe you mention it. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. Star Wars yeah. all the time. But uh, even the references of, to like smuggling runs and trade routes and things like that, yeah. you can tell that there's like a, a further universe in Star Wars that hasn't been exactly. explored yet. You know what yeah. I mean? But um, uh, I, Robert, I, I saw that movie... Jesus, it's been a very, very long time since I saw it. I saw it when, not in the cinema, but you know when a movie first comes out on DVD and x Vision and things like that. Yeah. You know, back back, then, back when I Robot actually came out. I think I watched it one night at my cousin's house. 
and I wasn't that impressed with it. Um, I, to be honest with you, I've only seen it the once, and I can't remember everything about it. But I yeah. do remember Will Smith's character being very anti-robot. Yeah. You know, he's very he doesn't trust them, and I think that kind of contributes to what you were saying about how the humans interact with the robots. I think maybe I should give it a little rewatch with that in mind and see if it, it changes my view of the movie. Yeah, maybe if, if you go out a second time and you know what to expect based on what I've just told you, based on what, yeah. the, what the literature was like. Um, the female in it, Susan Calvin, I think was mm-hmm. the character's name, she's pretty much the main character in the books most of the time. Uh, okay. um, but in the books, most of the books anyway, she's uh, older. Mm-hmm. It's later on in life. She's in her 50s, 60s, 70s even. Uh, okay. um, the books are slow moving. They're very analytical. It's all about... And in fact, there's a scene where there's a warehouse full of robots in the film. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to figure out which is the robot that they're after. He says, how would we do that? And she says something like, we'd have to interview each robot individually, analyze their responses, and look out for minor fluctuations in their response times and stuff like this. Yeah. Uh, and then he says, what about this? And he starts shooting them in the head one at a time. And then the robot they're looking for, you know, does a runner. Yeah. What was great about that scene was the way she wanted to handle the situation is exactly how they would have handled the situation in the books. Very yeah. thought out, methodical kind of processes all the time. And you would actually be reading this. You'd be reading every detail of the interviews. Um, whereas the film, obviously, because it's a film, nobody wants to watch interviews in a film. No. That's my pause that I was going. It's a nice touch, and it doesn't really piss all over the literature, because at least the Susan Calvin character acknowledged literature. Yes, she wanted to do it that way. Yeah, Will Smith yeah. goes all Will Smith, and that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so my number two, I remember I said that the last video was going to be a joint number two, because I couldn't decide which uh, film I preferred out of the two of them, but I have decided in that week long space, I figured it out. Now, I will mention, I will mention my, my other number two in passing, just so people know. I don't want to keep people in suspense. It was Titanic. What? Yes, Titanic. I, I remember watching that movie when I was like eight or nine years old. VHS, sitting down with my mom and dad to watch it and being amazed at that movie. Just like the special, special effects, Kate Winslet's tits. Nine-year-old me will always have a little something special going on for Kate Winslet. 23-year-old me also has something special going on for Kate Winslet. Watch the film Little Children. The title sounds perverted when I say the next part, but she gets absolutely lamped out on top of a drawer, and it's class. Really? Yeah. Also, The Reader. Have you ever seen that film? No, I haven't seen that either. Both of them films, they just gave me the impression they were very kind of uh, dramatic and arty. Oh, and they, oh they are. Yeah. They are very arty, but Kate Winslet... But you're telling me now that there's boobs. Oh, Kate Winslet gets molested twice. I say molested in a good way, not in a bad way. Like, Well, in fairness, in the reader, she's banging like a 15 or 16-year-old boy. Wow. So, yeah, and she is also a Nazi. Re- a Nazi. Kate Winslet yeah. is a Nazi. Banging a 15-year-old young yeah. yeah. So. Hold on, I have to make changes to my top five list now. <laughs> so, anyway, my proper number two, fav- second favourite film of all time, is The Lion King. I, d- I didn't hear you quite right there, Matthew. Did you just say The Lion King? Yes, I did. And I will explain why in five points or less. Okay? Please do. Number five. One of the greatest soundtracks to a film of all time. Every, oh, single, enough, yeah. so- every single song on that soundtrack is sing-alongable. That's a word now as well. And just amazing. The Circle of Life. Can You Feel the Love Tonight? Uh, Hakuna Matata. You know? Just mm. amazing, absolutely amazing so that's number five number four I just think it's got great voice acting okay James Earl Jones as Mufasa alone oh yeah okay Classic. Matthew Broderick not a great actor but his voice is very good for the film I might, uh, I'd be fairly fond of Broderick now who is he that? is he he's uh, Simba Simba yeah. adult Simba I, I don't think I ever caught that yeah, no, I, I actually, I, I MDB'd it today to have a look at who did the voice because I was that kind of, like, I wasn't sure. And I was very what surprised. What did it sound like? You know what you were talking about, Jim? Well, no, I do know what I'm talking about, but I just, I, I had to IMDB it because I didn't know who did the voice of Simba. Number three is, it's heart-wrenchingly depressing. I mean, 
that moment when Mufasa falls off that cliff and gets trampled and Simba's trying to wake him up with the head and ah oh, Jesus like you know what I mean yeah I have to give you that you, you would be in tears you know yeah, the first 100%. time I watched it I was in tears there's, there's not enough of that these days no there you, really you is get, you get films like uh, let's say I suppose Toy Story 3 comes close for having it, moments in it like that but the thing you're getting all these warnings contain scenes of mild peril in case your kids yeah. get fucking traumatized by it, like you know. Whereas yeah. back in the good old days of, of Disney and what have you, every one of those films had something in it that was distressing. Bambi. But few few oh, Bambi's a, a documentary about how yeah. cruel it is to be a deer. Exactly, yeah. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. It's but like I mean that's the reason that I think it's such a, a, a classic is because people it's like no I don't want to say real life because not everyone's dad gets murdered by their uncle and not everyone's so. No, but I mean, like, basically, they're just setting kids up for shit happens, and you just have to deal with it. Yeah, there's not enough of that. There's not enough of that. No. Also, a shout out for voice acting. Jeremy Irons is the voice of Scar. Jeremy Irons. You know. Yeah. The lad, and also Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, she one of the hyenas. She is, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Probably one of her about better roles. Yeah, that in Star Trek: The Next Generation. Oh yeah. Did you know Pretty she has no eyebrows? Really? Yeah, check her out next time you see her. No eyebrows. That's mad. And you know who else has no eyebrows? Who? Mona Lisa. As in the painting? Yes. Fuck oh, off, really? You forgot to do the fucking eyebrows. What a prick. Check it out. I'm gonna Google that right now. Jeez, I hope I'm not wrong. Maybe I dreamt it. Well, Mother of Christ, she has no eyebrows. So, now you know. So, that's number three. Number two, I just want to say that. It's just a great movie. That's my number two point. This is just a classic movie. You know what I mean? It's just one of those movies that I'll watch it over and over again, and I'll never get sick of it. Uh, and number one, uh, Jeff Katzenberg, who uh, he oversaw the whole production. I, uh, when I found out he was in charge of it, and all the films he made later on, like Shrek and you know those kind of DreamWorks movies, I was like, "Good lad, Jeff." It's nice to see a Jew do well in Hollywood for once. Especially under the fact that he was working for Walt Disney. Uh, uh, well, obviously not Walt Disney at the time. I, I'm assuming he was dead by then. But you know, the Disney company uh, as a whole was founded by a man who was uh, apparently very Nazi-ish. That's true, yeah. But well, sometimes so, you do your best work when you have that kind of boss, you know? Yes. Cracking yeah. the whip. Also, innovation in uh, special effects. I mean, it took them three years just to anim- animate the, uh, the scene where the... I want to say Buffalo, but it could be Wildebeest. I think it is Wildebeest, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Them running the other thing and crushing uh, Mufasa, that took three years to animate. I remember that. There was a lot of hype around that at the time. You know, there was all I these mean, behind-the-scenes documentaries on TV where they showed all the, the, the very blocky-looking 3D kind of hmm. uh, basic animation and then layering in the colours and all that, and, and people were kind of were, were blown away by it. Was that before Toy Story it was, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, Toy Story it was, was 19... Well before it, yeah. Seven, I want to say. And even mm. when you when you look back now, it's not as if uh, when you think back to the earliest version of anything, like the earliest version of a video game, it looks poxy compared to today's versions. Yes. But with that, that scene in the Lion King looks as good, if not better, than something that would have been done today. Yeah. So it's just a, it's just a brilliant movie. And when the Blu-ray came out, I didn't buy the Blu-ray because I didn't have money at the time. But I am. When next purchase of a Blu-ray is going to be the Lion King Blu-ray. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you Lion King. Pretty good. Uh, I was shocked at first, mainly because yeah. it's not what you expect to hear in somebody's top five. Um, yeah. But on reflection and listening to the points you made, yeah, top notch. Yeah. It's, it, also, it's it's a groundbreaking movie. Go on. I went to Disneyland um, for my anniversary. Yeah. Happiest place on earth. Mm. It really is. Like I was sitting there for the ho- walking around. Uh, it was just brilliant, and we went into this like 4D movie theater where they like, spray with wind and water and all that shit, and they showed clips of um, different Disney movies like in 3D, and they had yeah. the water zone. They had like The Little Mermaid and Cinderella and The Lion King. They did, you know, I just can't wait to be king, and it was one of the happiest moments of the last four or five years of my life. So it's just like, oh, I feel like I'm six and seven again watching all of these. Classic movie, so yeah, I'm gonna buy the Disney collection. I, I'm yeah. just gonna do it. I don't care. Uh, my kids are gonna watch those movies before they watch shit like the Avengers and all that. No, I say shit like the Avengers, even though I named the Avengers in the top five. But I mean, 
they're going to watch the Disney movies, but then life is hard. <laughs> and then I'm going to teach them about superheroes and stuff. The old school Disney stuff, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, still yeah. the hard knock stuff. Yes. And so here, tell, me, here. tell me about uh, Disneyland now in Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like the, the rides and the roller coasters and stuff like that. Yeah. Do they still have, like, signs that say you must be this tall to ride? Or did they just get rid of that because the rides would all be empty? Uh, there are height restrictions. So, I still defend Titanic to the ground as a very, very good movie with flaws and Kate Winslet's tits. Yeah. Again, uh, it was just the initial shock of hearing you say Titanic. In fairness, it is actually a good film. Uh, it's a little bit long-winded. But then again, it's oh. it's one of these epics. They, they yeah. have a story to tell, so it's going to take four hours to so get comfortable. Yeah, and t- exactly. to do it in an hour and a half, you're going to just turn it into a into a popcorn, fucking ridiculous, you know, blockbuster action yeah. film. Exactly, yeah. So there was only so much they could do. I'd give it a half a ship. Yes. Half a ship up. <laughs> so we'll move on to your number two. Number two. Um, what did I say about this? Oh, yeah, no, so I, th- I thought most people would like this. I think you might like it. The Ring. Ah. Now, are we talking American or Japanese? Just The Ring, not Ringu. Uh, <laughs> uh, it would be um, most racist and also the best impression of a Japanese person I've seen in a while. Thank you. I, um... Well, you heard about the Japanese ring after I saw the American ring. Same. It was, I, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was a few years ago when and it was the kind of thing where these days if a film is getting made, you automatically hear about the original straight away while it's being made. Like, let's take, uh, what was that one? All Boy. There'd be, there'd be very few people who wouldn't be aware that there's an original All Boy. As I said, I don't know whether it was a different time back then or ever. What are we talking? Maybe 10 years? Less than 10 years, yeah. isn't it? Oh, maybe, no. Maybe. I remember, I'd say it wrong. Uh, Let's say seven or eight years. That's my guess. What's your guess? I'm going to go longer. I'm going to say like 2003, 2004 maybe. Yeah? Yeah, because like, yeah, i got to remember six, seven years. Jesus, 2002. Two? Yeah. What's that? 13 years? 11, 11. years? <laughs> yes. We, we've got that bit of <laughs> <laughs> I, I did see the Japanese version afterwards, maybe a year or two afterwards. Somebody told me about it in work, and it was on late, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, Channel 4 or something like this. I didn't think it was very good. Mm-hmm. And everybody is supposed to say, no, the American version is crap, the Japanese version is amazing. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I loved the American version so much, and it was the, the first one I was familiar with. Yeah. That the other one just seemed... I don't know, have you seen both versions? I have seen both versions, and I also prefer the American one. Really? Yes, I also prefer the American one. I don't know what it is. I just, I, I think maybe because I saw the American version first. You know what I mean? And I just. Am we right in saying in the Japanese version, uh, the corpses, you know, when people die, they just, they didn't have like mad makeup or anything. They just look like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm really sure. Yeah. 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 Um, some people might say that the American version was over the top. We having the really warped faces. Yeah. Uh, when you think about the film itself, what's the girl's name? Samara. Yeah. Um, what does she really do to you in the end? You don't really know. It's she just frightens you. She scares you to death. You, you never actually see any violence, as far as I remember. No, um, I think most of the violence is not done by her. It's done by other people. Maybe yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's true. That's true. But the, but the way she kills people, um, in the Japanese version, okay, you know that she scared them to death. But they just look mental, like this. Whereas in the American version, their faces are all fucked up and warped. So you get the feeling that's something severely kind of supernatural going. Yeah. You're not just being frightened to death. Because if you're just frightened to death in the real world, it's just like having a heart attack. You're not going to end up with a weird face. Yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm going off topic here. The reason I love the film so much, right, is because I generally don't like horror films. I don't like, I mean, I like the classics, like I like The Thing, and I like, you know, the original Halloween, all that kind of thing. Modern horror films, sorry, go on. I'm going to own up and say I've never seen The Thing. Oh, man, classic. Have you seen even the new version? No, no, I haven't seen either. I've heard the new version is very good, but I haven't seen either one. Save, save the new one, see the old one first. Okay. Okay, the old one has obviously practical effects in it. 
okay? Mm -hmm. So they're going to be a little bit chappy looking compared to the modern CGI. Um, but in saying that, the recent film, they, they did a really good job of capturing the tone of the first film, the original film. They didn't yeah. kind of piss all over it by going bigger and better with everything because obviously they have a better budget and better technology. Um, it was it was a lot of people thought it was gonna basically rewrite the history of the original film. I think it was nineteen eighty six yeah. or, or thereabouts. Um, but it didn't. It didn't. It, it embraced it. So where was I going? Yeah, I don't like horror films. I just I, I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy getting scared for scared sake. A lot of the time it's because uh, like nine times out of ten, most frights that you see in a modern horror are uh, basically you're jumping out of your seat because of the sound. Mm. A good example is uh, Insidious. Did you see that? I did. I did. Well, I've seen that in the pictures, and I remember being scared. Uh, but I seen it here a couple of weeks ago. It was on TV. It was on Netflix. And I was watching it with a few of the girls and that. And they were jumping every five minutes. But it occurred to me they were only jumping because of the noise of it. Yeah. I mean, there was there was two or three occasions where literally there was actually nothing happening on screen. It was just a very loud violin blast that was making them jump out of their seats. And that's fucking ridiculous. Yes, it is. So anyway, the point is, that's what most horror films are like. Maybe Insidious is an extreme example, but that's the gist of it. Whereas The Ring came along and it had a fucking great story. It did. Great acting. Uh, what's that girl's name? Naomi Watts. Naomi Watts. I think she's a great actress. Uh, she really is. underrated. She was brilliant, brilliant in that. And also, something that they did different from a lot of horror films, she had to be what? Late Torbies? Most horror but, films, the, the, the main actress is going to be like 17 years old. Yeah. So what was and she's she's uh, I, I don't know if she was that age when they were making it or if her character was supposed to be that age. Yeah. But she was definitely like at the youngest she was late twenties. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and you're also talking about the fact that she's like she's a good looking woman, but she's oh, yeah. not that stereotypical like, you know, hot female who gets stabbed in the tip. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. She's she's like a natural kind of beauty. Very, so very, yeah, that, very that down to earth, very grounded, yeah, yeah. kind of uh, attainable, you know? Yeah. Also, uh, one thing that I loved about that movie was they didn't rely on, like, a super... It was kind of a supernatural force. You know, your woman was a, a bitch who got fucked in a well when she was younger, yeah. Johnny. But it, it turned, like, an inanimate object, like a TV, into something to be fucking petrified of. You yes. know what I mean? Like, TV, like, if you saw that static after seeing that film, all yeah. right? You got yourself, even though you knew it wasn't real. You part of you was like, "Oh fuck, she's going!" Like, you know what I mean, that, yeah. that, I thought that was really, really good the way they did that. I don't know if you've ever heard the the Shrek soundtrack. No, no, I haven't. There's, this, there's a song on it. I don't know who it is, but either the end of it or the start of it. I think it's the end of it. There's this 20 seconds of kind of weird noises, mm -hmm. and it's like literally the weird noises from the ring tape. Oh really? So like the odd time. The young one does be listening to that upstairs. And I'll, I'll come walking out of the kitchen. Now you hear this sound coming from... And, and it's like the force thing in the head. Oh my God, she's watching the ring tape. Because uh, that was actually a classic scene in that film where, spoiler alert, um, she finds her son watching the tape. Oh, Jesus, yeah. That was yeah. heartbreaking. Because you can really picture the scene. You can picture this young one not knowing that he's doing anything wrong. And there's nothing particularly wrong in the tape, apart from maybe a yeah. nail going through somebody's fingernail. Um... But yeah, he doesn't realise the shitstorm he just caused by watching this tape. And yeah. she's freaked out by it. Another thing I want to mention about the film, why I like it so much, good storyline, good acting, kind of things you don't typically find in a good horror, or in any horror film. Um, the soundtrack, mm. it's, it, it's, it wasn't just your typical background kind of droning sounds that you get in most horrors with the odd spike to remind you to be scared. Yeah. It had a proper, there was melodies in there that stick with you. Like the old classic horrors like... The Thing and, and, and Halloween. The Exorcist. They had tunes that when you hear it, you go, oh yeah, there's the Halloween tune. Because it was an actual tune, which you just, you tend not to get in horrors. Yeah. They don't get tunes. They yeah. just get noises. You get a violin. Although, that being said, while we're ripping into violin strikes, the person who innovated that and probably put it to bed is used Hitchcock in, the, in Psycho. Yes. You know, I think everyone's trying to mimic that now. They're trying to get that Psycho. Din, 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 din. Speaking so, of Psycho... Have you seen uh, the original Carrie? Yes, I have seen the original Carrie. Recently? It was like a year or two ago. Yeah. Not that, not that recently, but uh, it's it's not a good film. It's not good, no. no Does, do you know, what, not... you know what's very good in it? 
the uh, what's her name? Sissy Spacek. Yeah. Perry, right? She played an amazing role. She really came across as what I think she was meant to come across, although I haven't read the book. Yeah. She just this this innocent girl doesn't understand the world, doesn't understand what's going on around her, hasn't got a yeah. clue. And she wasn't your typical horror uh like let's say Samara. She had this power and maybe if she had been raised differently by different parents or whatever, she might have been a superhero, but she's not. She's a fucking monster killing people with their imaginations and what have you. Um, yeah. Carrie was kind of like that. And even in the end, even when she did all that, whatever, right, the climax, she still didn't come across like a monster. She just couldn't control herself, yeah. you know? And I think just think she played that really well. But apart from that, a uh, fucking shy film. Oh, right? That's terrible. And Absolutely what reminded terrible. me was you were saying about the psycho and the violin streaks. They literally ripped that sound straight out of psycho. Every time oh, she no, used no. that magic, every time she moved a book, or a young fella fell off his bike, or somebody got stabbed, it was... I was like, I are you serious? I and the know. school, it was called Bates High School. <laughs> I was like, yeah, do you have any fucking original ideas? I think the reason people love that film so much, or why it gets so, so much recognition, is that just the scene where she gets the, the blood dropped on her. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But the build-up to that is fucking atrocious. Yeah. Absolutely atrocious. And I just want to point something out, because I noticed it when they were talking about... Uh, I think it was everything. I watched the video actually recently, which was everything wrong with Carrie in like five minutes or something. Yes, I see that. And yeah, it's like John Travolta's character is getting a blowjob in a car, and it's like, how is she talking? She's she still talking, talking, talking though. Yeah. And you're like, like, what are you doing down there? <laughs> yeah. It's like, how did I not notice that the first time around? It's like, you should, if you're talking, you're doing it wrong, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, that's my opinion. And the ridiculous I, fucking, yeah. uh, like, getting dressed montage with the three lads shopping together. Yeah. It was like absolutely. a comedy moment or something. And it was yeah. so long and boring that they fast forward a bit of it. Like, it's literally <laughs> fast forward <laughs> in the movie. Yeah. It's like, no, just cut the fucking thing out. It's crap. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it is. Oh, it right. is tripe. Absolute tripe, yeah. I'm looking forward to the uh, remake. I, I, I've heard mixed things about it. The reason I'm looking forward to it is because of... Uh, Chloe Moritz. I think she's an, an amazing actress. I really do think she's an amazing actress. Yeah. Uh, actually, funny story about her. Well, kind of to do with her. I had a copy of Empire Magazine one day. She, my mate, I had the, the page open, but it was like the title page. And it was a picture of her. Now, I have to say, looking at the picture offhand, you would think this is like a 24, 25-year-old girl, right? Yeah. And he just looks briefly at the picture and just goes, oh, that fucking lamp or elven. And I was like, that's great. She's like 14. And he's just like, oh, for fuck's sake. He yeah. was so horrified. And I was like, it's all right. In about four years' time, you'll be able to say it without getting in trouble. Uh, how old is she now? I think she's only like 16. So She's still only 16? Around that, yeah, yeah. And I remember when Kick and Ass came out, there was this controversy about her being fucking... The other way she says that, all right, let's see what you cunts can do. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, baby, is it, is it that... Much of a thing. Yeah, she's 16. Yeah, she's 16. Well, that's... 16 is good in Ireland. Is it good in Hong Kong? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm really mm. not sure. Better safe really. than sorry, imagine. Yeah, definitely. Just in case anyone's watching. But it's it's safe for me. So, yeah, I can say that she's, she's beautiful. And the thing is, that might be the one kind of downfall, is that uh, it's kind of hard to explain a girl that good-looking being so kind of removed from society in our school. You can yeah. understand uh, Sissy's basic because she kind of looks like a freak and, you know, just that kind of dorky, geeky looking girl and, and nobody would be. Whereas somebody who looked like Chloe Moretz, I imagine she'd be fairly popular in school, especially with the lads. Yeah, yeah, I so think. It's, it's hard for me to take her as this kind of dorky, unattractive girl because yeah. I would absolutely Although... fucking smash her back doors in. <laughs> I think the isolation part is. I think the isolation from everyone else from school is down to um, her mother. Yeah. The mother character has to be well portrayed. And Julianne Moore is playing the mother, and she's a class actress as well. Yes. Definitely doesn't get the credit she deserves, I don't think. Yeah. Julianne. Yeah, uh, ju judging by the trailer, um, yeah. Julianne Moore, she seems to be playing the part a lot more kind of realistically, I suppose. Whereas the original yeah, mother, it was like a cartoonish version of a. It was very hammy. Fundamentalist fucking Christian or whatever, you know? Yeah, very, very, very hammy. Uh, also, uh, an honourable mention to Julianne Morris Baps as well in this video. 
Uh, yeah. Watch Chloe. Her and Amanda Seyfried go all out on each other. We're talking Black Swan, Mila Kunis, Natalie Portman style. I don't like Amanda Seyfried. Oh, she, she's it's getting like there's, there's something about her face. Her eyes are too far apart or something. I don't know, there's just something about her I, I like. There's just, just something. I don't know what it is. Knox. Is Liam Neeson so, in that film? Yes, he is, and he gets wanked off in a greenhouse. Why do you guys see that? How did I not see that bit? I remember the wank. Oh. Because she tells Julianne more about it, doesn't she? Yeah, in the hotel room. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. I don't remember the two of them getting around. Oh, yeah, they get down to business, man, I'm telling you. Are you sure you didn't dream it? No, I'm definitely sure I didn't dream it, because I watched it twice. 